Okay. So today's topic, we're going to be talking about safety communications and firefighter rehabilitation. I've combined the two aspects of the playbook into this one PowerPoint because they have a lot of synergies and they work together quite well. So I thought, hey, let's let's put these together and uh, and make it into one unit. Uh, one of the most important units, our stress within the CSRD, we stress very strongly the, the safety aspect of the job we do. It's a very dangerous job. It's something that, you know, uh, there are a lot of ways we can injure ourselves. So understanding the safety aspects, uh, this is bare bones, meat and potatoes. This is our bread and butter. We need to be able to do this. Uh, our number one responsibility is to make sure we get home to our families and to make sure our team gets home. So uh, this uh, component teaches us quite a bit about the safety aspects uh, that we need to be aware of for the job we do. All right, so basically fire is an important element in all cultures, right? Uh, you know, properly used, it provides warmth, it's security, light, cooks food, uh, we help, it helps us to manufacture tools. When it goes uncontrolled, that's when it destroys lives, property, and, and has such very negative consequences for everybody involved. Um, so understanding where we come from as firefighters and the history of the fire service really, uh, you know, is, is important for us, knowing why we do what we do. Uh, where did the fire service come from? Um, and I mean, it dates back, we can look back as, as far back as, you know, 1608 in Jamestown, first major recorded fire in the New World. Uh, burned down many structures in, a set, in, a, in the settlement in Jamestown then. Um, and a lot of the history that we're going to be going through today is going to be the American side of the history. And that's what, you know, a lot, a lot of our North American fire service kind of came from, from, from that side. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of emphasis on that. So in Boston, uh, as early as 1631, uh, there were codes that started being introduced. Uh, they banned things like thatched roofs and, and wooden chimneys. <laughs> Hard to believe, but they actually had wooden chimneys at one point in time. Uh, in 1653, the first fire engine was purchased. Uh, 1678, the first paid fire company. Um, and so you see this, uh, what we do in our profession dates back a very long way. Uh, numerous other situations have come up and fires have come up that have, that have made the job we do uh, that much more important. Um, from New Amsterdam in 1674, um, basically they, they, the governor at that time was able to uh, form the first fire organization or fire department. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of the beginnings and the history of where we started. Um, in Philadelphia, it came about in 1735. Um, and then we can look forward and look at the Industrial Revolution, mid 1800s. Stronger and lighter steel is replacing, uh, you know, is replacing iron in some buildings. You get steel frame buildings. So we're moving away now from a lot of the combustible materials that really started, you know, when we were when we were building. And this is all because of the the, the impacts of fire in those communities. Uh, in 1896, the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, was actually formed. Uh, what the NFPA does is they develop consensus-based codes and standards, and what they're trying to do is ensure the fire and life safety standards are, are set for the public. We set a nice ba uh, a best practices, a guideline for others to, to follow with, uh, with uh, fire and life safety at top of mind. Um, the first standard that they made was actually NFPA 13, and that regulated the uh, design and installation of fire protection sprinkler systems, which again, a long time ago, and they were and they made that code. Um, some major fires, you know, really really brought some uh, the safety aspects of the job that we do uh, to the forefront. Uh, in 1903, there was a fire in Chicago at a place called the Iroquois Fire Theater. Uh, it claimed the lives of 602 occupants and it injured 250 others. Uh, they had combustible scenery, curtains, and interior finishes. Um, most of the victims uh, either suffocated or they were trampled in the ensuing chaos from that fire happening. Uh, and what that resulted in is requirements on exit hardware. So the panic hardware that we have now, doors exiting, you know, pushing outwards as opposed to pulling inwards. Uh, those kind of codes came from these tragic situations. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes these tragic situations for us to make any kind of, uh, of movement forward. Um, other great, uh, other fires, you may have heard of the Great Fire of 1904 in Toronto. 
uh, that was a fire that uh, destroyed eventually 104 buildings uh, in the central business district in Toronto. Um, unprotected elevator shafts and stairways really contributed to the rapid fire spread in those buildings and it led to major uh, changes in Toronto's building code. Um, some of you may have be aware of the Coconut Grove nightclub fire that happened in 1942. That was in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, you had 492 occupants of that, uh, of that nightclub parish. Um, the investigation and, the, and uh, the reports afterwards said overcrowding, combustible interior finishes, decorations, and a lack of emergency lighting caused those deaths. Uh, what that resulted in was an increase in fire and life safety requirements for assembly-based occupancy. So places where we come to congregate and gather, like nightclubs. Um, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, major fire. Uh, Our Lady of Angels School, and, that, and their fire was in 1944. Our Lady of Angels School in Chicago, Illinois is 1958. So I really encourage you to look in, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through every single one uh, of the, the major events that shaped our fire service, but I certainly encourage you to read the chapter and the orientation on it because there are some great things in there. One I will focus on a little bit though, and just mention before I move on is the station nightclub fire that happened in West Warwick, uh, Rhode Island. And for those of you who've taken some of the higher level courses, you may have seen, seen what happened there. And they actually have videotape uh, evidence of what happened there. Um, what you, the outcome of that was 100 people died, 256 were injured. Um, the fire was started by stage pyrotechnics. There was a band playing on stage. Uh, they started shooting off pyrotechnics. Uh, behind them, the scenery was basically just curtains, and these curtains uh, were it caught fire. Um, there was no sprinkler system, and it really led to mat like to the fire spreading incredibly rapidly. And you can actually see in this video from the start of the fire how quickly it progressed to a point where panic ensued. And people in their in their desire to get out and trying to get out ended up trampling others, ended up trying to find and uh, and trying to find other ways out. Um, what happened there? I mean, they they realized that the lack of sprinkler system allowed that fire to progress very rapidly. Um, but you had uh, many of the fatalities happened because people were trying to leave through through the the entrances that they came into, or and some of and uh, and they weren't using the emergency uh, entrances. Some of those emergency entrances actually ended up being blocked and, and chained. Uh, that was to prevent people from coming in from the outside, but to, you know, chaining of those emergency exits, uh, at the end of the day, it ended up resulting in, in a, quite a significant loss of life with everybody trying to funnel towards the same main ent entrances that they came in from. And that's just human nature, right? We're, you know, we know that entrance, we came in that way, we're gonna go in, we're gonna come out that way because we know what's out there. Uh, whereas trying to use an emergency exit, you know, was it well enough lit? Uh, and certainly having chains on it wouldn't help uh, when you're trying to flee a fire. So again, that's just a few of the situations. And I mean, there's also, you know, the World Trade Center, other situations where we look in the, the fire service, uh, you know, either itself suffered major casualties or, you know, citizens uh, suffered casualties as a result of fire. And it really brings home why we do the job we do. So fire, we have some guidelines as firefighters and guidelines we need to follow. We need to be proud of these guidelines. And the basic fundamental guidelines that we need to be able to follow are, are, are pretty straightforward. The number one is we need to be safe, okay? Number two, we need to follow orders. Following orders, you know, if we, if we don't follow orders and if we do, if we do what we call freelancing, people get injured, people get lost on fire scenes and, and chaos ensues. Uh, so we need to follow the directives that are given to us by our superiors. Uh, we need to work as a team. Uh, this is a very team-based job that we do. Uh, firefighting, we can't do alone. You know, I, we've, you know I, I, when I was the chief in the last department I was in, I would have somebody show up, somebody showed up at my door, hey, the lodge is on fire. Oh, that's great. Did you call 911? Because I can't do anything by myself without a fire truck and the rest of my team. I need that team there. Uh, there's too many jobs on a fire scene for one person. So we work together. We need to have that camaraderie and that ability to do that. The next guideline to the, is think, all right? This is not a job that we can just, you know, kind of go through and, and, and uh, like half aware. Uh, we need to be on our, uh, we need to be alert. We need to be thinking. We need to have our head on a swivel and we need to be, uh, and, and we need to be looking, what's the next step? What's the next thing? Um, 
always following orders, always staying within the chain of command, but each and every one of us has a responsibility out there to use our noggin and not just be automatons. We need to, we need to be always assessing the information coming to us. And <clears throat> the last one is follow the golden rule. Let's, you know, and that kind of works with everything and with everybody, right? We, we need to treat others the way we treat that we want to be treated. And by doing that, all these other ones are going to flow from it. We're going to be safe. We're going to be able, you know, we're going to, we're going to follow orders because, you know, we're going to treat that incident commander the same way we would want to be treated in command. We're going to work as a team because we would want others to work as a team and we're going to think. Now the mission of the fire service. So primary mission of the fire service, and many of you have heard this before, but the primary mission is to save lives and to protect property and the environment through four main pillars. And that's prevention, education, suppression, and rescue activities. We're the only, so with prevention, we're the only job, we're the only line of work that actually tries to put ourselves out of business with fire prevention. We try to educate the public to prevent fires. We try to limit the, uh, the damage from fires by, uh, by, by trying to get better safety recommendations out to the politicians for building codes and, and improving the way that we build our build uh, structures, the use of sprinklers, the you know, use of non-combustible material and panic hardware. So again, you know, that's a, that's, that's a huge part of the job we do. We're never going to be able to eliminate them completely, but, but we're, gonna, we're sure gonna try and we wanna educate those. So the more we know, the more we can pass on. And that comes with the, you know, with education. We're educating the public. So that's how we provide that, pre that prevention. Uh, we give them the knowledge they need, like, uh, you know, the stats on, on, uh, on houses that are able to be saved by using uh, sprinklers that don't. Um, the Fire Smart campaign is a great example of the educational opportunities where we get out to the communities, we try to, you know, and, and we explain to them, you know, the benefits of Fire Smart, what it can mean for you and, and, and how it can protect your property. It also gives us a better chance of being able to protect the property when we get out there. Uh, suppression, pretty straightforward. That's what a lot of us know with the fire service. Um, we're the ones who show up on the big truck <clears throat> with the uh, with all the hose lines uh, ready to go, and we're going to put that fire out. We're going to take that that you know that 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 person is having a bad day. We're gonna we're gonna stop you know it from getting any worse, and we're gonna try to make it a little bit better. Um, so part big part of that suppression is you know we've got to remember that it's about people, right? The job we do is about the people who are involved. And if we can keep that in mind, you know, we're really, we're, we're kind of a step ahead of the game. It's not just about putting the wet stuff on the red stuff. And then rescue activities. Uh, and those rescue activities in some departments might mean road rescue, swift water rescue. Uh, it also, you know, means in, in structure fires and being, you know, and being able to save those who, who might need some saving. Uh, uh, so, and, and this is, and those rescue activities in some departments take up a great, great deal of their time. And other, you know, in other departments, um, they're not doing a lot. They're not necessarily doing the outside things like road rescue, but but that doesn't mean that we're not there to really help people and rescue them in need. So, you know, our mission is to fulfill those stated goals and objectives, and and, and the objectives that we contain within the department's mission statement. And I'm going to talk about our mission statement fairly soon because we do have one in the Columbia Issue Swap Regional District, and it's important to have one. Um, the statements, uh, you know, your mission statements are usually going to be posted in a facility and available to the department members and the public. Well, we're actually going through and, and, and now that we've got, uh, that we've been able to make a draft of this, we're looking to, to, uh, to get these printed out in high quality and uh, have them posted in each one of the fire halls. So, like I said, mission statement. The mission statement forms the foundation for all activities in an organization. Um, Basically, your mission, uh, the, the mission's part of the mission statement, it's, it's just a, sh a short statement about why this organization exists. Uh, and if you can read on the screen here, you know, R says to serve the communities of the Columbia Shoe Swap Regional District through excellence in fire protection, prevention, education, and safety. So that's really hitting pretty much the core values of the fire service in general. Um, so a vision statement is a declaration of the organization's objectives. You know, where do we want to be, right? And so in our vision statement, we said to create resilient communities through our efforts in, a, in, a, in the fire service in coordination with the public. 
So we're working with the public. We're a part of the team. We're the ones who are trying to work with them to make them more resilient so that we're able, so that, you know, we're not impacted by fire quite the same way. And, uh, you know, maybe we can learn from the lessons of the past and, and try to re avoid repeating them. So the values section of it is, you know, we're looking at it, that represents the core values of an organization, you know, and typically we want that to be short enough so that we can easily remember it. Um, and again, we want to, we're looking to post it. I mean, this is something we want to live by. I mean, so <clears throat> what Paul, what this uh, mission vision value statement does is, you know, it's a guide for our decision making. It helps us make good decisions by saying, is this in line with our mission and what we are in and, and our vision and our values? Is this going to help us further achieve the goals to, to reach our vision? And is this keeping in line with the values that we've stated? And there are a number of values that we have within this mission, vision, value statement. You can see four on the main screen there right now. And those four are the uh, our community, teamwork, professionalism, and integrity. Now, I wasn't able to get everything up on, <clears throat> on this one because it is a rather large uh, mission, uh, mission, vision, and value statement. Well, it's a little, you know, it's a little longer, um, especially because of the formatting. So I'm just going to pull this up very quickly for you and show you the other ones that we have. So we had community, teamwork, professionalism, integrity, safety, and leadership. These are the things that we value and we expand on that. Why do we value them? It's all in there and we look forward to being able to provide you with something that you can post at your fire halls. And, and we wanna live by this, right? This was, this was not done in a vacuum. This was not me sitting in an office deciding what our mission, vision, and values are. This was done in consultation with all fire departments through your representative, uh, which are the fire chiefs at the, uh, at the fire chiefs. So I encourage you, uh, I did send the mission value statement as a handout. I encourage you to read it, I encourage you to, to remember it, and to really live by it. Um, so All right, let's talk a little bit about the culture of the fire service. <clears throat> Understanding the culture of the fire service will help us better understand the values of the fire service. So the culture is basically just about shared assumptions, beliefs, uh, and values of the group or organization, right? So we, we, it's based on a history. Um, so we look at, uh, we need to, with our culture, we look at certain things like our organizational characteristics, like our command structure. We have a chain of command. Um, we use ranks to define position. We wear uniforms. Some, you know, some have badges and other symbols of rank. Uh, and there's an emphasis on teamwork, discipline, and following orders. And discipline isn't a negative thing. Discipline can be a very positive thing. It can be done in a very positive way. Uh, but the idea being that we want to, to modify behavior to ensure that we're all following in line with, with, uh, with our shared goals and our shared objectives. <clears throat> so another part, you know, there's been some cultural changes. Uh, so one of the big things that, you know, there's been some changes in is diversity. Uh, you know, we used to be a very, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very bland, kind of all, all male, everybody's gonna, you know, everybody's kind of the same, you know, and all white male. Uh, and that's been changing over time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to say that's not part of the fire service anymore. Um, we're not there yet. We still have some ways to go, but we, but, you know, I certainly hope and, and strive for in the, in the regional district to ensure that we have, uh, you know, that we encourage diversity and we, we encourage, uh, <clears throat> we encourage those who may not have traditionally found a role in the fire service to know that they have a place with us. Um, there's often a resistance to change within the fire service as well. I, you know, I, I've always heard it said, you know, the two things that firefighters hate most are the way things are and change. And I think that actually does bear some fruit. I've heard, I, I've seen it play out in, in, in a number of ways because we love what we do. We, you know, we do love what we do. There is always something that can be done better. And everybody thinks they know the way it should be done better. And maybe, you know, it doesn't necessarily jive with the way that I want it to be done. But, you know, we, we also, with that teamwork aspect of it always seemed to pull through that and find a way to make, you know, the right choices so that we can move forward and, and, and really improve and grow as a, as a organization. Uh, we now find a fire service that we have differences of personal characteristics and, you know, you, there's, you know, different worldviews, core values, um, different generations, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and peer groups that, that are joining. Um, 
sometimes, you know, if we start getting, you know, if, if certain groups, uh, you know, joining and, and, and uh, uh, it might not fit in with the same core values that, you know, some of the original members would have. Sometimes that leads to a resistance to allowing people that are different to join their ranks. But that, that, that diversity can really be a strength and brings to us, you know, if we all think about everything and we have our tunnel vision and we think we know the way the world works and we don't allow this outside, uh, you know, other voices to, to at the table, we're really, our, our, our profession is going to stagnate and it's going to fail. Uh, we need the new ideas. We need these voices to be heard. Um, and so part of that is we need to be able to accept our personal responsibility to help that happen, right? You know, accountability is a base is a basis uh, for a successful and safe career in the fire service, right? We make our department better through our actions and the image that we project, uh, or we can make it worse if uh, if that image and the way that we act and carry ourselves uh, is not in keeping with our values. So some of the cultural strengths that we can that we can think of, you know, when I think about firefighters and when you think about firefighters, I hope that certain things come to mind, like integrity, right? Doing the right thing just because it's right, not necessarily because it's required, right? And that's even when nobody's looking, we're doing the right thing. We have integrity, um, and I know that the, all the firefighters in the CSRD that I've worked with, you know, over the years, really show a huge amount of integrity. You know, we've joined to 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 help our communities. Uh, to do what we can for our neighbors and and we do what's right um, you know we doesn't mean we don't make mistakes but we're, we certainly do if we make those mistakes you know we own up to it and we uh, we learn from it and we move on um, moral character I mean that's kind of a loaded term and something you know some people can say oh well that's you know they have different ideas on morality but really it's just about doing right or just behavior right uh, and the emphasis on you know when with our moral to character is is trust it instills trust in others if if we are you know and and we need the the residents and and citizens to trust us we are going into their homes we are having to put out the fires we come to them at their worst and lowest time and if they don't trust us if they don't believe in us you know if we had you know then then where are we going to be we're not going to be able to do our job work ethic uh, so we value the virtues of hard work and thoroughness. We want to, we, we do work hard. We understand the job we do is hard. We're in heavy turnout gear. We're humping hose. We're moving all like, and we're doing a lot. Uh, it takes a lot, but we put our head down and we get it done. And we don't stop until the job is done. Um, you know, rehab being the exception for that. Um, pride. We take pride in what we do, right? Uh, you know, I'm proud to be a firefighter. I'm proud to have joined the fire service. I'm proud to be serving with such amazing people in the CSRD. So that pride is that feeling of self-respect and personal worth that comes from being a part of something bigger and that comes from being a part of something noble. Um, courage. You hear that a lot as well, right? You hear about courage, the, the, the ability to, to run towards the danger as opposed to running away. No, I, I, I temper that courage side of things. And yes, we do have to have a certain degree of courage, but we also have to keep that thinking in mind. We don't ju we're not just courage and brave for the sake of it. We, do, we still take calculated, we, we, we will take calculated risks uh, when there's something to be saved. We will take, we, but we're not going to put our own lives on the line to save that which is already lost or that which has no value. Right, so we need to be aware of that. But courage is certainly something we want to, that we need to have, and it doesn't mean you know you're never afraid, right? You can't be courageous if you're not afraid. Loyalty, oops, sorry, loyalty um, is a, is another one, and uh, you know we're loyal to each other, we're loyal to the organization, and 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 I find this is true in in all aspects, right? Uh, you know, um, I'm proud of of the department I came from. I'm proud of the departments that I'm with right now, and I know all of you feel that way, you know, and I hope all of you feel that way. It's hard to stay in an organization, you know, and and to, and to feel that same loyalty if you're not a part of something that uh, that you can feel that pride in, but. You know, and this this loyalty, it's basically the attitude we display by, you know, by at times, you know, you know, risking our lives, putting ourselves in personal danger to save, you know, trapped or missing persons and and take care of families or uh, even, you know, helping our fellow firefighter who might have fallen and we need to help them. Right. So we're loyal to them. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to just leave them there and be like, oh, that's your own problem. People going through issues in, a, in, in our fire service, you know, our own members, we're going to help them. And we do that. And uh, and again, that's another reason why I am proud of being a firefighter. 
uh, respect, right? And so that's, we, we need to have respect for ourselves, for others. That attitude of, or admiration of a, uh, admiration or esteem that we show towards peers and superiors, right? So, you know, respecting your superior, yes, that's something that, that said, you know, you, you have to respect the authority, you have to respect, uh, and you have to respect your fellow firefighters. Respect should be returned in all, in all cases as well. And the, the chiefs I know that we have certainly respect their teams and have nothing but the best things to say. These guys talk you up all the time. So they have a huge respect for the work you do and uh, they will put their noses on the line for you. And uh, <clears throat> you, you, you need to know that. So that respect needs to be returned as well. And then compa compassion, right? We have a caring that we show towards citizens, our fellow firefighters and all their families, right? We have compassion. That's why we join. We want to help. So we have some organizational principles as well and the foundation of the fire service and the way that these are is you know a few of these organizational principles the way that we set up our chain of command the way that we set up our fire services there is a very paramilitary system to it right um so i i have on here you know kind of a little just uh demonstration of uh, you know a basic org chart on the left and that org chart really is what our departments have and you know below those captains is all the firefighters within that organization right they they report up you know to the deputy chief and fire chief and those fire chief the, the fire chief ha, you know d then reports up the line right and you know i could keep this line going on as well past the past the protective services team leader on up to the operations management the cao and the board of directors of the csrd we all have somebody to answer to we have a chain of command um and we need to understand that formal line of authority responsibility and uh, and communication um, and we need to use this because, you know, it would be very difficult, you know, especially at a fire scene, right? It, a lot more democratic when you get into a fire hall, uh, people's opinions can be said. There is still going to be, you know, uh, based on rank, there's still going to be, you know, decisions that have to be made. Um, but when we're on a fire scene, you know, the incident commander says something, we got to do it, right? We got to jump to it. There isn't this, you know, the, if they invite questions, which most of our amazing incident commanders, if not all, do, um, they invite input. Um, but uh, once the decision is made, it's time to hop to. So, that, so again, chain of commands, that formal line of authority. The, and then there's another concept that we learn in ICS 100 that's called unity of command. And that, that concept is basically just that every, uh, every employee reports directly to one supervisor, just one supervisor, right? Um, and uh, that, what that means is, again, you know who your boss is. There's two bosses at the same, that, that, that I need to necessarily speak to. That can get a little muddied sometimes in our paid on call services, especially at the captain level. Uh, but one department that I saw did it really well a while back and that I've been trying to really push towards, you know, making this more, you know, formalized throughout is the Ranchero Deep Creek Department, who you can see on video right there. Way to go, boys. <laughs> so these guys set up a, a system where the captains have a set of firefighters underneath them and each of the firefighters reports to one specific captain. Uh, and that's uh, something that I certainly encourage. Uh, I set up the same thing in my previous department uh, when I went back there. We had one captain was doing training, one captain was doing equipment, and one captain was doing apparatus. And then you had a number of firefighters beneath them that were reporting up to that captain and helping with that responsibility for training apparatus or equipment. Uh, and again, shout out to Ranchero. You guys are the ones who brought that to me. So thanks for that. Um, so when we start talking about chain of command, unity of command, uh, something that really comes into play here is span of control, right? And what that is, is the, the, it, what we want to do is establish a maximum number of subordinates or functions beneath us uh, that one person can effectively manage or control. Um, in, uh, you know, in practice, it ranges from, you know, three to seven. Uh, seven being the absolute most. Five is really optimal, right? And the and this is all based on science as well. How you know in terms of multitasking, how many people can uh, one individual effectively control and manage? Uh, and what the science has shown us is that three to seven uh, is what we're looking at as an acceptable span of control. Five being optimal. Um, other organizational principles to keep in mind is the division of labor, right? The process of dividing larger jobs into smaller jobs, right? Many hands make lighter work. Uh, the need to assign responsibilities, prevent, try to prevent duplication of effort, uh, you know, and, and we want to assign specific clear-cut tasks, right? Uh, 
we need to be very clear on what we're doing, but we do need to, you know, we do need to share the load. One, again, this job can't be done by one, it comes back to that teamwork aspect and, and we need to be able to delegate. Uh, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've been under chiefs that, that uh, they kind of kept everything to themselves and thought they were doing the, a, a real big favor for everybody uh, by doing it that way didn't end up great when that chief left the organization. We had, you, the department had to relearn everything from scratch. How do we run a fire department at this point in time? So really that delegation, it's part of a healthy organization and I really, and, and, uh, and needs to be done at the fire halls as well. Uh, and then the final principle that I'll talk about a little bit is discipline. And like I said, discipline is not a dirty word. It's not a negative thing necessarily, right? But it is required um, and basically, we the discipline is administered through the rules of the organization. We have standard operating guidelines. Those standard operating guidelines talk about uh, you know progressive discipline, which you know goes with the you know the the, the verbal, the written, uh, the written warning, and then you know and, and steps beyond that could uh, could be up to and including termination of that of that employee. You never want to get to that point. A lot of times, and in ninety nine percent of the cases, a quick talk with the with the member that maybe did something you know against policy or or that wasn't quite right. Uh, a quick talk will 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 sort the situation out and can be a very positive experience, um, and it's part of providing leadership, right? One of those main principles with discipline is you know we 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 discipline you know we discipline it in private and we praise in public. Uh, so discipline is not something that you're not calling somebody out in front of the group. You're not trying to shame them into anything. But we do, it's just about correcting behavior and that can be accomplished much better and with more respect by doing it in a private setting. So we've got up here the main title, roles and responsibilities for the firefighter one. And this includes exterior and interior operations. After, you know, once you've completed all the modules for exterior and interior operations, you basically met the requirements for firefighter one under NFPA 1001, which is, uh, which is one of our standards. And we're going to talk about NFPA in this presentation a little bit as well. Um, so I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but you can find them in your book. Uh, and these are, these are important to know, uh, you know, what, uh, what are our responsibilities? But again, I don't expect you to memorize them after, you know, one, one class, but certainly look into it, look at the book and, uh, and, and, and get a sense of these. So some of the responsibilities, uh, to don and doff our personal protective equipment properly. We have to know how to hoist tools uh, using the appropriate ropes and knots. We need to understand and correctly and appropriately communicate the protocols, standard operating guidelines, right? Uh, we need to know how to use uh, self-contained breathing apparatus, SCBA. Uh, we need to be able to respond to an, uh, to an uh, to a emergency scene on an apparatus. Uh, and I mean, it sounds simple, but there are, you know, there are things we need to know to do that safely. Um, we need to establish and operate safely in emergency work areas. Uh, we need to know how to force entry into a structure. We need to exit a hazardous area safely as a team. Uh, a lot of emphasis on team here, right? Set a, we need to be able to set up and use ground ladders safely and correctly. We need to attack a passenger vehicle fire, uh, an exterior class A fire and an interior structure fire safely. Uh, we need to be able to conduct search and rescue inside of a fire building. We need to be able to perform ventilation, overhaul a fire scene, conserve property with salvage tools and equipment, connect to fire department, to water supply, extinguish uh, class A fires, B fires, C fires. We need to illuminate scenes, turn off utilities, combat ground fires, perform safety surveys, clean and maintain equipment, locate information in departmental documents, and operate as part of, part of a team. Whew. There is a lot we need to know. So uh, again, this is why we do the training we do. This is why we've continued the training that we, uh, that we do uh, for classroom training, even during this difficult time. And this is why you've all tuned in today is, for, is, is because we're continuing our education and continuing to learn. So I mentioned NFPA a few times already, and uh, the uh, NFPA sets standards that are best practices. So these NFPA standards, and something that's important to understand is these must be adopted by the authority having jurisdiction, AHJ. In this case, the authority having jurisdiction is the CSRD uh, to become requirements. So none of these are requirements until they're adopted by the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, but they are an excellent place to look for best practices. In certain cases, we've adopted 
some some NFPA guidelines, right? And and some of those would be it would be for you know uh, the the 1403, which is the live fire training standard, uh, and we we make sure we follow that pretty much to the letter, right? Uh, and that and and we've adopted that at the at this at the training center as uh, as our standard. We have not adopted NFPA 1001 as our full standard. We've adopted the playbook as their training standard and the exterior and interior operations components of those. So again, just because NFPA says it doesn't make it required, but it's an excellent place to look and, and uh, is filled with excellent best practices, uh, always done by committee of experts. So a couple of things the NFPA standards will help the fire service establish, will help do is they establish criteria for things like building materials, um, the equipment that we use, uh, fire and life safety systems and uh, and NFPA compliant uh, clothing that we're going to wear, equipment, you know, everything that we're going to use, uh, all come into it. You know, when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at purchasing an apparatus, there is an NFPA guide to you know to the standards for building apparatus. Um, uh, when <laughs> just about anything we do, you know, NFPA has a standard for driver and pump operator. That's the NFPA 1002 program, right? Uh, for fire investigators, fire inspectors, all of them have, have uh, NFPA standards associated with them. So one we're gonna talk about a little bit though is the NFPA 1500, because this is very important. It's the occupational health and safety, uh, basically standard on fire department occupational safety, health and wellness program. A bit of a mouthful as many of these, uh, as many of these are. Um, so the main, so you know what the what NFPA 1500 uh, addresses is you know we're trying to prevent things like fatalities, injuries, and illnesses, uh, and uh, and you know be, ensure that ensure that we're compliant with WorkSafe BC. WorkSafe BC is there to protect workers and uh, and to ensure that you know you're that you're taken care of. You know it's certainly something we don't need to be prodded on. But they said they've got their own regulations. Uh, I think it's part, what is it, part 33 or part 31 of work safe regulations are specifically for firefighters. So, uh, so the, you know, there's because of the job we do, certainly high risk, and there are a lot of concerns, right? But the main goals of uh, any health and safety program in the fire hall is uh, like developing health and safety policies, uh, ensuring that health and safety training is taking place. Uh, John, yes. uh, I'm not sure if it's on your end, but there's a lot of feedback right now. Okay, I'm not hearing any of it. Is any is uh, yeah, any problem there. Better now, but it really distorted there for a bit. Okay. Might have something to do with my Wi-Fi. Is anybody else hearing it? Yeah, I am too. Yeah, I heard it too. Same. Yeah, yeah, I heard yeah, it too. It's all jumble up. Yeah, I heard it there just for a second. <laughs> all right. Well, click in again if it's happening. Uh, I'll I'll go back again just quickly here and talk about the main goals of the health and safety program, uh, which are developing health and safety policies, ensuring that health and safety training is delivered to employees, and accident prevention. So NFPA 1500, basically it's the most comprehensive standard relating to fire, fire health and safety that we have. Uh, it specifies minimum requirements for departmental safety and health programs um, and sets minimum standards. Uh, WorkSafe BC all has its own guidelines uh, as far as health and safety organizations go and they have a, a whole set of criteria that need to be met and we meet those criteria under WorkSafe BC. Um, you know, uh, so uh, some of the policies and procedures are, you know, things like we want to address as 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 quickly as we can. Things like obvious firefighting hazards. Um, what do we do when there's hazardous materials releases, communicable diseases like we're dealing with right now? Uh, and so the health and safety, you know, the OHS committee has certainly been involved in discussions. Um, you know, we acted very quickly when this this came down. Um, but then, you know, ensured that we were communicating with the OHS committee about what was being done uh, to ensure the safety of our firefighters. And really, what that's doing is is following the medical advice of the of the uh, the, the federal and provincial officers, health officers. Uh, other things like hazards when driving apparatus. Um, we also need to have programs, you know, that, that, that we're able to deal with things like, pro, you know, alcohol abuse and drug abuse. Uh, we do have SOGs that, that, that uh, 
talk about that. We also have an employee assistance program that uh, individuals can call in. Um, we have a chaplaincy program that, that people can tap into that, is, that has some amazing uh, chaplains as part of that program. Our, our critical incident stress management program for, you know, uh, and this has come up as, a, as kind of a newer thing, um, is, is critical incident stress management. Uh, we see some, we have the ability and, and at times firefighters see some pretty na nasty things uh, and it can, it can have an effect on you over time. Uh, a lot of times it's a cumulative effect and we want to make sure we're taking care of our own. We want to make sure that we're, that uh, we're providing resources to, to try and, you know, help people get back to where they were before experiencing that traumatic event. Um, we don't want anybody to go away from their time serving with the fire department uh, any worse off or having any any issues if we can avoid it. And we're going to do everything we can to provide the resources they're going to need uh, to get better. Uh, so not just the policies on these kind of things, but we also do training and education. Um, we talk about, you know, what are the, how do we become proficient in what we do? How do we ensure that they're trained adequately for the job they do? Uh, talk about the, you know, the training requirements meeting, you know, whether it's NFPA standards or we meeting playbook standards. Uh, and in this case, we're meeting playbook standards. So other things, uh, you know, um, it talks about for drivers, safety requirements uh, for all for the use of fire department apparatus, uh, minimum requirements for driver operators in terms of their training. It also, you know, the, and 1500 also goes into protective clothing and equipment. Um, what would that we have to wear it when we go into uh, environments that are IDLH immediately uh, uh, detrimental to life and health, right? Um, <clears throat> also talks about, you know, emergency operations, facility safety, uh, so making sure our fire halls are safe, medical, and you know, the, what are the medical and physical requirements for firefighting? Um, and I mean, that's, you know, for us, it's, it's, you know, we're not putting people through a lot of fitness tests, but we, we do have a medical questionnaire that we're making sure that people uh, sign and, are, and that, uh, you know, they can have those discussions with their doctors if, uh, if they meet any of the criteria on that medical questionnaire. Um, so member assistance and wellness programs, like I mentioned already, we have an employee assistance program. Uh, and then I've already talked a little bit about critical incident stress management and, uh, and our commitment to ensure that we do the best we can for our members who experience it. So injury prevention. We wouldn't be talking safety if we weren't talking injury, preve injury prevention, right? And injury prevention really is the responsibility of every member of that firefighting team. Um, there's a few things we can consider, three things in spe specifically that we can consider uh, to ensure safety. Uh, number one is standards. Standards like NFPA, Work Safe BC, or SOG. So those are standards that have been put in, sorry, not our SOG, but NFPA and, and, and Work Safe BC. Those are standards. They have been uh, put in place by organizations to, you know, to, and with NFPA, again, guidelines until we adopt them. Work Safe BC, no, those are standards we need to meet just by being in the province of BC. Um, the second thing after standards is procedures. So that's our standard operating guidelines. How do we do the job we, that we do, right? Making sure we have standard operating guidelines that can be referred to, making sure we follow the standard operating guidelines <coughs> and, that we don't, and that we don't veer away from those, right? Just because they're called guidelines doesn't mean that you don't have to follow them. In fact, but they are our policy, they are required. And then after standards, procedures, the last of the three there is training. Uh, firefighters need to be trained for the tasks that they're asked to do. And that is something that, that, uh, that doesn't change uh, throughout any of our departments. We, we don't ask a member to do something that they are not trained to do. Uh, and on the fire ground, at an emergency scene is not, a time for, is not the time for training. Um, although you can get a lot of, uh, your experience is going to provide you with more knowledge and make you better at the job, but you need to have an idea of how to do the job before you, before you get on there. And the number one thing of that is being safe, which is why this uh, component of our training, the safety and communications aspect of it, very bare bones, very minimum. After, this, uh, after doing this, you're going to have those basic skills you need to be able to respond. You might not be able to do anything when you get there, and you might just have to stand back and sit in a manning pool. The fact is you're going to be able to get on a truck, you're going to be able to don your gear, you're going to be able to do these things after you've gone through the, this classroom, done the, done the uh, written evaluation, and done your, your practical skills sheet evaluation. So another aspect of safety that we need to keep in mind is tool and equipment safety, right? Um, 
like everything else, safety is the primary uh, consideration for the use of when we're using tools and equipment, right? Um, when we have, when we're safe with equipment, it's gonna, un, we can avoid unintentional injury or un, something, you know, these, un, these avoidable injuries. Um, so the way that we make our equipment safe is addressed again by three concepts. And again, pretty important thing, inspection, training, and maintenance, right? We need to make sure we're taking a look at them. We're inspecting them. We're looking for damage. We're training on them. We know how to use them. It's just not something that sits in the truck. Oh, what's that? Oh, I don't know. It looks like a water curtain or something. The chief told me I've never used it before. No, you need to know what it is. Um, and, and maintenance. We need to make sure that we're, we're keeping up on it. We're, you know, we're cleaning them. We're, we're, making sure that they're ready to go in order and we're repairing them when they get damaged. Uh, to, use, to use our tools uh, effectively and properly, we need to be in full PPE because some of these tools are sharp and can hurt us. Uh, wearing our gloves, that kind of thing. Uh, and that includes during maintenance work. As you can see, he's polishing an axe head there. He's wearing a glove so he doesn't slice his fingers off, right? Um, and then the tools and equipment need to be maintained to ensure readiness. To, uh, basically, we need to follow our manufacturer's instructions on cleaning and maintenance, and we only use those tools for the intended purpose, right? We're not using an axe as a pry bar, um, and <laughs> we're, you know, we're not using a, a ladder as a hammer. We're making sure we're using the equipment for, the, for what it was intended for, right? So when we talk about cleaning and inspecting hand tools, which is part of this component, we need to know how to do that, right? And there's a few things to, to, to keep in mind, right? Uh, we need to remove all, all large uh, material, dirt, all dirt and debris that we can. Um, if it's appropriate, depending on, on the tool, you might wanna use some soap and water. You learn what cleaning solutions are gonna be used for, uh, for various tools. And we need to inspect for damage. So like the guy in the bottom right-hand corner there is doing, he's looking for you know, any damage in the hose. Um, we need to avoid painting them. I mean, I've seen this in some departments where you, you know, you put a, you know, red, red paint on it so you can say where exact, what compartment that, uh, that tool came from, that halligan bar, that axe, whatever. We avoid painting them. Paint is a chemical and can cause chemical damage to our tools. Um, and, and we want to keep markings to a minimum. We may have to put something on there to say, you know, this is the property of, you know, Anglemont Fire Department or, but, uh, but that's not, but we want to keep that to a minimum if possible, right? Uh, we always return our tools to their proper location. We don't leave our tools lying around on a fire scene anywhere, anywhere where they can get stepped on or, and, and injure somebody, right? So always putting them back. Um, and basically we follow departmental procedure, right? So we want to clean and inspect our equipment uh, every time after use, right? Anytime we've used it, we're going to take a look at it. And then another time to, uh, to, that we can be inspecting and, uh, and cleaning if required would be during apparatus checks, during our duty crew time, right? We wanna, so that, uh, that's important. We, we keep eyes on it. We, we take care of our tools, they're gonna take care of us, and they're gonna last a lot longer. So I touched on this a little bit already as well, uh, but it is, it's a huge issue in, in, in the fire service and, and it's really only coming to, to light you know, somewhat recently in, in the overall scheme of things, if you look back to 1608. Um, is this idea of critical incident stress management, right? We face so many stressors, right? Uh, stressors like those that are connected directly to fighting the fire, knowing that people are, you know, are hurting from it, right? Um, some departments with their, you know, having to do emergency medical care. Um, added, and there's added burdens, you know, on, the, on some career firefighters, and even with us as paid on call, certainly, you know, with the sleep and meal schedules, we get called out in the middle of dinner, we get called out in the middle of the night, which disrupts our sleep pattern, that adds stress. We go from a situation where, you know, we're down low, and then all of a sudden the tones go off, and we're way up high, and that plays, you know, that, that puts a lot of stress on the human body. So we need to realize that the job we do is stressful. We're dealing with people and, and situations that, you know, some of their worst days of their life. And we know a lot of them. They're in our community, right? The stress, we also need to be aware, can have a variety of symptoms. Um, it can be people lashing out. It can be lack of inability to sleep, restlessness, intrusive thoughts, things like that start, start happening as a result of stress. And we need to be aware of it and really self-check and, and, and understand that. Um, you know, this, by maintaining a healthy lifestyle is certainly going to help that. Um, and, and, and we try to do that. Um, and then you looking for resources that can help us as well. And uh, we're a team. 
we're all resources for each other. We do, like I said, if, if you have difficulty talking with, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people, there's other options. There's the employee assistance program uh, that, that can be done over the phone and doesn't, and, and isn't somebody that you would know and is all totally confidential. Uh, there is the chaplaincy group if, if perhaps there's a religious element uh, that you'd like. And again, non-denominational, and they don't even have to bring religion into it. They're just an amazing group that, that, that are very good at counseling. And same with our critical incident stress management team. Um, both the chaplains and the, and the SISM team uh, can be deployed directly to a fire scene. Uh, and what they'll do is really just walk around and, 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 and uh, they know how to handle themselves on a scene where they can, where they can't go and what they can do. And they're looking at the members to see, you know, look for some of these signs and symptoms that maybe they're being affected by it and try to intervene before it becomes a major issue, right? So, uh, so know the resources, understand that they're there for you. And if you have any, you know, and if you don't know where to, how to get those resources, your captains, your deputy chiefs, your chiefs, myself, Derek, we're all here as resources as well to help hook you up with those, re with those, uh, with those programs that can help you. So critical incidents can include things like death, suicide, serious injury, terrorism. Um, you know, uh, there's been a lot of it and, and all of that can happen. And many of us have already experienced some, if not all of those situations, uh, depending on department and, and, and time in. Um, some individuals have a high capacity to deal with these uh, stressful situations. Others don't, and that's not a value judgment on the individual. It's just our own experience and where, you know, and, and how we're able to cope uh, and our own coping mechanisms. Um, doesn't make you less of a person to, to, to really feel the pain. In fact, I'd argue it makes you stronger to have that sense of empathy. Um, and like I mentioned, I think I mentioned this was critical incident stress. It can be cumulative. People say, oh, you get used to it. Not necessarily the case. In fact, not my experience with it. It's something that becomes cumulative. The more that you come into contact with, the more it piles on and the more it piles on and the less able you are to cope with it. Even though you might have seen that a similar situation, you might have seen death a hundred times, you know, 101 and it gets harder and 102 and it gets harder. Uh, so these things do pile up on, on you and you need to be aware of that. And it's I'm really also proud of the service of not being that, you know, it used to be a bottle of whiskey on the table was chatted out. It's not like that anymore. We're really focused in on the fact that, you know, we're, that, that we're all people. We do experience these things and it's important for our mental health to be on top of it. Um, we need to basically critical incident stress management prevents those emotional reactions from having a negative impact on us, right? Standard operating guidelines. So on the left of this slide, I've put basically we've, it, it's put in a, I put in each of the different headings and that's, we've broken it down by safety, operations, training, interagency, administration, records and references. So all of those topics are covered within our standard operating guidelines. And something that's important is to understand that these are policies, right? These and policies are uh, what they what policies do is they provide guidance for decision making, right? Very important to know that we we, we know our policies, we understand what they are, uh, and we need to make sure that we're using those policies to try and guide our decision making. I go out to a fire scene and I see fire coming from a roof. Uh, I know based on our operating guidelines, we aren't doing vertical ventilation. We're not going on top of that roof. And I know I've harped on this on a few of these uh, on the trainings, but uh, again, that's a guide for my decision making. I am not going to be putting people up there, right? Um, so what standard operating guidelines are in essence are a set of step-by-step -step instructions compiled by the organization to help workers, which in this case is firefighters, carry out some complex and tasks and in some cases even routine operations. Um, again, we talked about the, all manner of topics are covered within them. Uh, the operations, uh, you know, the, the one for structure fires is, is, is quite extensive and there's a lot to it. Uh, and some of them are much smaller, right? When you're talking about, you know, uh, some, you know, drug and alcohol program or something, it's a little bit, it's a little bit shorter, but we mature and, and our policy on people showing up to scene with that. So uh, it's pretty cut and dry. Don't. Um, Firefighters are expected to know and follow the SOGs. You are, so you are, you are, you are bound by them. You need to follow them. Know them, right? Bring them out in training. When you're doing a course, when you're doing something, talk about the SOGs. 
um, you know, we're going to do car, you know, we're going to do a, a car fire attack. Let's grab that. You know, let, we're going to, you know, say we're doing a, uh, interior search, uh, training, let's pull out the SOG uh, on structure fire and start looking at what, you know, what do we need to take into account about how that works. Right. They're, they're living documents they're breathing documents. They need to be updated quite regularly. They have just been updated and, uh, they're in the process right now of, you know, review approval and format. So hopefully we'll have a new set to, to bring out to you fairly shortly. So incident safety, keeping safe on a fire scene. Um, basically, first thing to understand, you know, I got that nice picture of the, the, the safety officer with his nice white hat and his, his wonderful jacket sitting there. But safety is everyone's responsibility, right? Um, it, it, we, it's from the, you know, your first, from your first fire to, to being, you know, command of, of the scene. It's everybody's responsibility, your safety and your partner and your team's safety. There. Um, when we get to larger incidents though, we want to look at possibly putting in something like an incident safety officer, a point that the incident safety officer should be appointed. Uh, and we typically do appoint safety officers at all major structure fires and larger calls. We're going to have a safety officer appointed, right? Um, basically their primary responsibility of the incident safety officer is the safety of the members at the scene. His, only, his or her only job at a fire scene is to look for things that might be potential safety hazards and get rid of those hazards. Well, you know, find, if they see people uh, you know, operating in an unsafe way, perhaps they're too close to the smoke and they're not wearing their SCBA, perhaps they're in a fall zone, those kind of situations they need to be on top of. They need to, and, and that's what a safety officer does. And I highly encourage every member here today to take our incident safety officer course because it's, it's vital information, not only for keeping, you know, uh, for being an incident safety officer, but just for keeping yourself safe at a fire scene. Um, the safety officer needs to be appointed by the incident commander. If the incident commander does not appoint an incident safety officer, that responsibility rests with the IC. They are now the incident safety officer and they must be considering incident safety, which they are anyways, but again, it, and, and this is why we appoint one is because there is a big job being in command of a fire scene. Uh, they've got a, you know, they've got a fire to deal with here. They've got a lot of members moving around. Having one person thinking about safety as their primary responsibility is a huge load off the incident commander's shoulders and is highly encouraged. All right, accountability. When we go to incidents, we need uh, basically a method of tracking personnel on a fire scene. We need to know who they are, where they are, and what they're doing, right? Uh, and we accomplish that using accountability. Uh, many of you have seen this before, Those, some of you have seen it but maybe not used it, is the accountability board. This is uh, an actual clip and the, the picture on here is the actual board that we use in the Columbia Shushwap Regional District. Um, so, and it's the accountability side of it where we start tracking our members' uh, movements. Uh, the black strips on the side there, that's to signify, where, and, and, the, and in the middle of the manning pool, that's to signify where we've got uh, uh, Velcro typically and what that Velcro does is it holds these accountability tags and so again the the fire department needs this command system that works with a command with accountability um, the accountability system needs to be able to record the individuals that are assigned to a specific team they need to be able to record what activities that specific team is doing uh, or uh, what their assignment is and then what they're and, and then what they're doing right so like who you are what you were assigned to do and what you're currently doing, right? And so this accountability system will then, it provides a current accounting of everyone, of everyone who's working on an incident scene. And that's not just firefighters, that's other responding personnel as well. We need to be accountable. We need to keep account of the police officers on scene, the BC ambulance, paramedics on scene, first responders, other agencies that we're working with, uh, and certainly our mutual aid partners. We need to keep account of them. If you're in, if you're in command, your, role, uh, your job is to make sure that you're able to account for all uh, and so again, we do that using this system. You can see on the left uh, of this slide, I did put a, you know, a little, uh, basically what's our, our passport accountability system. So the, uh, the, the, the thing that says engine one, uh, that's supposed to be like a passport, right? And the, you'll find these in every apparatus, should be two in every apparatus. In some cases, some departments are running with one, uh, but the two are for a backup, right? And 
it's the officer's role at any fire at any fire call to ensure that they're collecting the accountability tags from everybody in their apparatus that they're responsible for and they're then giving those tags to the incident commander when they get to the scene so the incident commander now knows who's shown up on what apparatus we have a system in the CSRD as well where these uh, accountability tags, the accountability tags are those smaller tags that are on the passport that says engine one. So the ones with our names like Potter, who's upside down, uh, my own name's there, um, Campbell. Uh, these are all, uh, these are our accountability tags. And those are the ones we should each be issued at least two and some, and some departments are issuing more than that. Uh, and they're color coded as you can see, and they're color coded based on training levels, right? Uh, as you can see on the right, the situation we we've set these these type of uh, these color this color system to help us and help the incident commander at a fire scene because we're we're, we're dealing with other departments you know uh, you know oftentimes we're going to have our mutual aid partners on a fire call uh, you know when I went to a fire today in Shoe Swap in in Blind Bay Shoe Swap fire department's there so is White Lake the incident commander may not be as familiar with the training levels of the White Lake firefighters. If they're following this tagging system, though, they have a better sense of exactly what their training level is. Are they a recruit? Are they exterior, interior, or a team, uh, or a team leader, or above? Right. So that can go up to company fire officer or higher. Uh, team leader basically means somebody who can lead people. They could and, and is is able to take command in a call. Uh, and it's important to understand the principles of ICS, though, with accountability, right? We need to understand those principles of span of control, uh, unity of command, and chain of command. We need to we need to really use those because once you know we're in command of a group uh, or a number of groups, that instant commander gets up to that number seven. Okay, we got to start thinking about maybe divvying the labor a little bit more and having uh, you know a couple more levels where we can have less responsibility on us and other people watching some of the uh, the people working on the scene. But accountability, vital. We need to do it. We need to keep track of the people. Uh, make sure nobody gets left behind. And, and uh, it's very dangerous when you lose track of somebody at a scene. Another part of the safety and communications aspect is the apparatus and vehicle safety, right? So personal protective gear, you know, a couple of things. There's some key components here. Personal protective gear. It should be properly positioned so you can don it quickly before you get on the apparatus. We don't get dressed uh, while we're while the vehicle is in motion. We make sure that uh, you know we've got our gear on and it's ready to go before we get into that apparatus. That's not including SCBA, um, but uh, you know certainly we want to make sure our PPE is on. Um, we want to be sure that our seatbelts are properly fastened. Uh, before the apparatus even begins to move. And that's your responsibility as a firefighter jumping into a seat to buckle up your, your seatbelt. Uh, it's also the officer's responsibility in that passenger seat in the front to make sure you're buckling up that seatbelt. It's also the driver's responsibility to ensure that you're buckling up your seatbelt. Everybody has to be sure that you're buckling up your seatbelt. We don't drive without it. This is one of the main ways that firefighters can die is en route to an, en route to an emergency call. So, so just the basics of things you would do anyways with your family, you have to do it in the fire truck as well. Uh, we need to make sure that all equipment is properly mounted and stowed or secured uh, as we're, uh, when the vehicle is in motion. We don't want loose items in the cab. Those loose items can end up injuring us in the event of an accident. Um, there's times when we want to be wearing hearing protection, possibly depending on the uh, on the noise level. But most of our rigs are pretty good, and and it's not too bad for the sound inside. Um, we're fall, you know, we're we're paying attention to traffic. We're paying attention to the others on the road, right? Just because we have lights and sirens going doesn't give us carte blanche to go uh, drive recklessly. Drivers operator, uh, this driver operator's responsibility to ensure that they're in control of their vehicle. Uh, it's also up to the officer to ensure that if that operator, for whatever reason, is driving, you know, a little faster than you think they should, or a little more dangerously than you think they should, that you that that uh, it's that officer's responsibility to speak up. So if you are driving someday and your officer tells you to show uh, slow down, you slow down. That's their job too. Uh, and another basic thing that you know we need to know is that we we've got to use the handrails and steps. We don't jump. Uh, from the apparatus when we get to a scene. People roll their ankles all the time. We don't know uh, exactly where they stop necessarily and what, and, uh, and what you're doing. So you're stepping off. You're using those handrails. You're using three points of contact when you're going on and off of the vehicle. And this is actually a part of the skill sheet is to make sure that you're able to do that. So again, you take it for granted, but people get injured when you don't do it. 
Um, and again, we talked about making sure your gear is on. We do not ever dress while the apparatus, uh, apparatus is in motion. Another aspect of safety and communication is that illumination of a fire scene. We need to provide a light. We are, you know, a lot of our calls, uh, the pager tones drop and it's the middle of the night. We have no light to work with, you know, unless we put the light there, right? So we need to understand how to work with small equipment or the apparatus uh, lighting to illuminate a fire scene. Um, so some of the things we need to use for that are things like the lights in particular, uh, generators, and a lot of times there's, uh, there's other equipment that's required, auxiliary electric equipment, electrical equipment, things like cables and extension cords, uh, possibly receptacles, connectors, junction boxes, adapters, you know, ground fault circuit interrupters. Uh, some departments have inverters. So understanding how your equipment works, understanding how to set it up, where is an appropriate place to set it up, um, and, uh, and uh, how to do it safely is one of the jobs that you, you should be proficient with at the end of your practical uh, component of, of this training. Utilities. So utilities like electrical, natural gas, propane, um, these things pose a threat to firefighters. Uh, shutting off utilities is one of the first tasks that most structure fires. Uh, and that's to protect the safety of the team, right? Once the utilities are controlled, uh, this needs to be communicated to the incident commander. So if you're the one that's been asked, you know, make sure you can you go shut off the gas? Absolutely, you go shut off the gas. You need to make sure you report that back to the incident commander. We expect BC Hydro to do the same if they shut off power to a unit. Uh, if you're inside of a building and you're and you're uh, and uh, and uh, on an interior attack and you're go and you've located the uh, the fuse panel and you've shut down the main power breaker, you need to communicate that with incident command. So the uh, incident command needs to be aware. We assume, uh, you know, those who are going to be in command are going to assume that uh, that everything is still live, power is still on, gas is still flowing, unless we have confirmation by somebody who actually shut it off. All right, and that includes those wires. We might see, you know, we might see a wire where we 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 figure it must be, you know, might must be tripped. It, you know, it's taken so much damage. We never assume that. Same with the wire down, right? And until we know for sure and we get confirmation that it's not alive anymore, we treat it as a live uh, as a live wire. Until we know that the gas is shut off, we treat it as being on. All firefighters need to know how to shut off a building's electrical, gas, and water service. So when we talk about electrical service, um, you know, elect uh, electricity is like, it's an invisible hazard at, at, uh, at emergency scenes. Um, the type of electricity that we're dealing with depends on the utility company and the age of the system. Um, energized power lines are, are present at a number of scenes. Uh, you can see them at this one here. Many scenes we go to, we're gonna see, and, and a lot of our residents are, are getting power from overhead power lines. They're not necessarily gonna be buried. Um, we're always like first thing to think about is always look for those overhead lines when we're raising ladders right when we're parking an apparatus we want to make sure that we're not parking underneath a power line that may end up going down and uh, and and if we do we want to try and move that apparatus if that's possible depending on the situation uh, important to know BC uh, Hydro is is dispatched to all structure fire scenes in the CSRD you know they're gonna they're, they're gonna come out uh, they're gonna be dispatched fairly quickly um, they'll disconnect the power to the structure from the nearest point available uh, on the line. Um, they can pull meters from a house if required uh, to make sure that that power is not going to be reconnected unless you know a safety uh, inspection has taken place. Um, during any firefighting operation, the power supply should be turned off if at all possible. Right? Um, we need to park at the like I said apparatus outside of the area of the power lines. Down lines are considered energized and we don't use water to suppress fires on near downed power lines, right? Water is a very good conductor of electricity uh, and that's a surefire way to get yourself hurt. Um, so when we look at interior ops, I mean, we need to look, that's where we start looking at the firefighter doing the electrical disconnection, right? Because we've got to actually be physically inside of the structure and locate that, that, uh, that, that fuse box like we have on the right hand side there. Uh, to, to find the main power breaker and shut it down. Uh, and this is something you'll learn when you take the interior live fire course. And, uh, and, and uh, until that time though, it's, as an exterior firefighter, it's not an option for us because like I said, most of the, uh, these are always located inside the structure. 
natural gas, right? Uh, another one of our hazards and utilities to take care of. Uh, it's delivered through a network of underground pipes. Some of us have this in our areas and some don't, and maybe are using propane or some other type of, uh, of fuel. Um, in its purest form, uh, it's called, it's basically methane, right? And methane has a flammability range of between five and five and 15%. It's actually a pretty large flammability range. Not as, not as large as smoke, but it's still a very large uh, flammability range. Um, natural gas is lighter than air, right? Um, it rises and will diffuse with oxygen. That's actually a good thing for us and very safe uh, because it'll, it'll disperse itself within the atmosphere, right? Um, Natural gas is not toxic, uh, but it is still classified as an asphyxiant because it displaces uh, the oxygen available and, and therefore the oxygen level will uh, be depleted. And, you know, if in sufficient quantities, natural gas displaces the oxygen, we, have, we don't have enough oxygen to breathe, right? Normal air is around 21%. At something around six, uh, 17, uh, 16, 17%, we have, you know, we can't sustain life anymore. Um, and natural gas can displace that oxygen and cause that situation to happen. Um, natural gas also, it's, you know, originally won't have any odor, but we're usually, but it's usually there's a smell added and that smell is added so that we can notice it and recognize that there's a leak. Uh, natural gas can often be shut out, shut off at the meter. Um, and you can see kind of a couple of the shutoffs that, uh, in, in the pictures, uh, that we have there, um, on, on the, on the slide. Uh, usually the, the shutoff for these are located outside. So as an exterior operations firefighter, we can do this, right? Uh, you need to know how to close the, how to close the valve using a spanner wrench or a pipe wrench or some other kind of, uh, of, of hose key. Uh, and I put a couple of pictures of what those look like actually in the center there. Uh, on that uh, cheap plastic spanner on the top, you see uh, the, the slit on the back end on the lower right. Uh, that, that, that hole there uh, is basically for the gas key. Uh, same thing on the handle of the of the cutters that we have on the picture below it. Uh, one side has a hook, the other side that's a, there's a little wedge, but there's a gas key right there. So that actually fits over top of where that picture you see the arrow going to, uh, and it allows you to shut it down. Basically, it's typically you're turning it about 90 degrees, and that and and that will shut off the gas supply to the house. Sean. Yes. One thing to uh, rem uh, think about uh, for everybody is uh, what they, where your arrow is pointing to, Fortis has two different sizes of those uh, valves. They are integrating into a newer valve there and it's got a bigger knob on it. So okay. newer yeah. homes will have a larger, or the newer valve. Okay, um, so I'm thinking that picture of the tool on the bottom would likely still work while as that uh, cheap spanner up top not so much maybe um, so it's something to be aware of and if you're noticing that you know you might not have the right tool anymore that's something to keep on top of and maybe we need to ensure that we we get the proper keys for uh, to, to shut off these new 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 control valves thanks Darcy So we talked about natural gas. Some of us don't have that. Some of us are using uh, LPG or liquefied petroleum gas, right? Um, and basically what LPG is, it's, it's fuel gases stored in a liquid state under pressure, right? Um, two main gases uh, are classified, uh, are under this classification of LPG, and that's uh, butane um, and propane. Propane by far the most widely used uh, as far as heating goes, right? Butane, we don't use quite as often. Um, so a lot of times it can be used as fuel in campers, manufactured homes, agricultural applications, uh, rural homes. Many of our rural homes are gonna have, you know, these big propane tanks out back. Uh, some, sometimes it's used as, you know, I had, a, I had a truck that ran on propane. So, you know, it can be used as a fuel for vehicles as well. It also has no odor, but a smell is added. So we know when it's, uh, when it's, be, when it's leaking. Non-toxic, classified in asphyxiant because again, displaces air uh, and oxygen. Um, it's one and a half times as heavy as air. So it's heavier than air, which means it will sink. Unlike natural gas, which will, dis uh, which will go up into the atmosphere and dissipate. Uh, Propane will not. It will actually go lower. It will find. It will pool in in 
in any low lying areas. It will, you, you may actually end up having, you know, standing and not knowing it, but standing in a pool of, of gas, uh, which again, if mixed in the right concentration with air and then provided an ignition source can ignite. Uh, its explosive concentrations are between 1.5 and 10%. Again, that's a pretty large, uh, large range. Um, and it doesn't take much of it for, for us to have enough for it to, uh, to sustain combustion. <clears throat> um, typically, LPG and uh, propane gas is shipped in, right? So it's not going to be coming in from a, a network of underground pipes. This is going to be shipped in using tankers and trucks that are going to, you know, pull up uh, at the residence uh, and, and fill up that propane tank. Uh, again, stored in those cylinders, uh, close, and, and, to, and these cylinders may end up being something like closer than we'd like to the to the structures, uh, and they can provide they actually become an exposure risk, uh, something that could end up um, ex what we call a blevy, a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Um, what if that uh, if the propane inside that tank heats up enough, uh, it's quite a spectacular uh, explosion that can can result from that. Uh, but it's not one you want to be close to when it happens. Uh, the supply for, for propane needs to be stopped by shutting off a valve. Uh, it's tip, typically at the tank. And uh, there's a picture of one of those valves right there. Uh, basically, by shutting that tap, it's like a tap. And by shutting that off, uh, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, so shut her down. And then uh, that should shut off the propane to the, to the residents. All right, mentioned quickly as well, water service, a little less of a concern in most cases, but there are times when we want to be able to shut off the water service to prevent water damage. Our job is to try and make their job, their lives better, the residents uh, that are experiencing this fire. We don't want to have any more water damage than, uh, you know, than, than is necessary there. Um, and that can come in situations with like sprinklers that we maybe can't find a way to shut off. We're going to want to shut off the water supply to try and prevent those sprinklers from keeping on going, right? Typically, we're going to find shutoff or an isolation valve that's located on the property or uh, somewhere near an access point. Uh, a lot of times on the curbs, um, there's uh, usually the location is going to depend on on, uh, on where the distribution lines are in that area. Uh, water shutoff keys, those uh, so the center picture there, those are water shutoff keys that are used a lot of times by the comp water companies. Uh, it's like uh, or pipe wrenches can also be used. Um, and you want to turn it about 90 degrees again, and that'll shut off the water supply. Uh, commercial structures and large institutions and industrial, uh, and industrial facilities are going to have much larger water, uh, water lines, uh, supply lines. Um, they're going to require special water keys, so we might not have access to them. Uh, and the restoration of water, that's going to be the responsibility of uh, the owner uh, in consultation with the water department. And so, you know, when they're ready to get water back on, it's their responsibility to go and make sure they contact the utility. All right, so we've talked about safety for a little while. Let's talk about communications for a little bit now, too. Uh, so with communications, as firefighters, we need to be able to communicate using numerous applications, right? Um, uh, a couple of distinctions to, to make here, uh, you know, and two of the main ways that we're going to communicate, certainly on fire scenes, is, uh, you know, between with radios. And there's two types of radios uh, in this picture up here I have. Um, one is a portable radio. That's the handheld one on the left. Uh, so portable radios, handheld the radios that are assigned to a specific personnel. Um, the other one is called a mobile radio. And I know it's weird that, you know, they're both mobile, but this is a mobile radio basically is about a truck mounted radio powered by the vehicle's electrical system. So understanding the difference between the both of them is certainly important. Uh, so telephone communications, right? Fire departments, we could get a, a variety of type of calls. We do have unmanned halls, but you could still be at the fire hall and receive a phone call and, and understanding how to deal with it is important, right? So you're at the fire hall. Let's say you get an emergency call, right? How do we do that? Let's go through a few steps. All right. First, you want to answer the call fairly promptly. You want to identify your agency, right? I'm with, you know, uh, Scotch Creek, Lee Creek Fire Department. Uh, you want to be assertive and professional, right? You want to sound like you know what you're doing and not be, you know, kind of a too mousy on the phone. Uh, and you want to be non-emotional, right? So, you know, it's not like, what do you want, right? We're, 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 we're professional. We're going to answer in a professional way. Um, if the, it becomes clear that the call that you're taking is an emergency call, you direct them immediately to 911, right? Um, 
firefight, you know, you can take down some cool, really quick basic things, you know, a structure fire at this address. Okay, good to know. Call 911. I, I need the rest of my people here. Again, this is teamwork. Having just you, not going to help them. Getting 911 and getting the page out started is, is your primary concern. So get that going as quickly as possible, right? Um, if it's a non-emergency call, we still, we want to answer promptly. We want to use professional tone of voice. We want to be friendly. Um, we want to try and determine why are they calling, right? Uh, and we use active listening skills, right? Repeat back to them what they, you know, to make sure that you're understanding what the person is asking about. Um, we want to respond uh, some way to whatever the, the caller is asking us for. Uh, write down the information uh, if, if they're asking for a return call and it's for somebody who's not there, the fire chief, deputy chief, or training officer maybe, and they're not in the building. Well, you know, write down the information. You're, you, it's much easier to remember that way. Uh, if you're able to, provide them with the information they need uh, and try to resolve that problem. Um, we then, you know, again, end the call. We want to be courteous. We're going to be the last to hang up, right? Let the other people hang up first. We'll hang up last, right? And then you're going to make sure that that message that you took, if you did take a message, gets to the to the, the needed recipient. You can post it note in some cases, message board. So this is going to be again. We, I walked you through this. We're going to go through this a little bit in your own halls. Uh, this is on one of the skill sheets. Is how to answer a telephone. So we'll see this again. All right, we talked about portable radios a little bit, right? The portable radios are the ones issued to individuals, the little handheld ones. Um, they're pretty amazing little units. They're designed to withstand heat, moisture, physical impacts, so, you know, mechanical damage. They're powered by rechargeable batteries um, in, in, in our halls uh, and in most halls. They could be, you know, replaceable battery packs too, uh, but most of ours are rechargeable. Uh, the controls on ours uh, on a radio, it basically comes with a, a knob for cha changing channels. So you're going to have one of the knobs is going to help you change between the different channels. It might be your uh, your duplex channel, which is for the for the repeater, uh, or it might be for a simplex channel, like a tactical channel that's only for a line of sight. So understanding, you know, uh, how to use that and how to ch how to change channels and what the different channels do, very important. Uh, there's also knobs for uh, adjusting volume. Uh, there's typically a push to talk switch that you're going to have to depress to uh, when you're actually communicating and talking into the radio. Um, most of them have an uh, orange or red emergency button on them as well that you can use. And, you know, not the best way to signal an emergency in most of our calls we're looking at. You know, we've got uh, pass alarms and calling maydays, uh, but, you know, understanding that feature, also important. Um, they're made in tr what we call intrinsically safe. So they can be used in hazardous atmospheres, maybe something where, you know, uh, where we have a gas leak. You can still use these because they are, the, the housing of the, the radio itself does not allow any of the sparks to, to leave that, uh, that radio. Uh, and those sparks would be an ignition point that could then uh, spark a, a, an explosion or a large fire. So, uh, but not with our radios, intrinsically safe. And that's why we pay a premium for them. Um, understanding how to operate the radio that's assigned to you and how to make it uh, make it work, uh, incredibly important, right? And uh, not just how to make it work, but how to make it work when you're in full, in full turnout gear with gloves and all the different noises that are going on and around. And that's going to come with experience, but it's also something we can practice and something we can train with. Um, understanding your department's SOGs as far as communications go is important and, uh, you know, and, and learning how to make it operate. So a couple of things like, you know, you're going to get better reception if you hold it perpendicular as opposed to kind of way down off at, at the side, right? That's something that's important to, to, to realize. Um, you, removing the radio from your holster, from, where, from your pocket or your belt clip, it, it also might help at times to improve communication if it's not right up against your body. Um, it's important to realize, right? Radio transmissions to dispatch are recorded. Right, and uh, the public can listen to them using scanners. We have, uh, you know, a lot of member of the public out there would likely have, uh, you know, their own radios uh, that can actually pick up how, you know, our calls. Uh, we need to be professional on them. We never say anything of a sensitive nature or anything that we might later regret uh, getting out to the general public. Uh, if you need to have a private conversation, you have that private conversation face to face. It doesn't happen over a portable radio. Um, with Surrey Dispatch, we use uh, a way of talking that's known as plain English, right? <laughs> I guess it's a straight way, plain language and phrases. Um, there was a, there are other techniques, there are other systems out there, including ten codes, which uh, which used to be used quite widely. 
Um, the problem is that they can become problematic because understanding it, if you can't memorize what each of the 10 codes is, uh, it can be very difficult. So I'm going to pull up right now, uh, actually, our plain languages, uh, words and phrases. And this is another handout that I had sent out to all the departments. So if you don't have it, ask your chief or your training officer. They do have copies of these. Uh, but it goes through, you know, uh, different ways of saying things. You know, we say acknowledge, uh, you know, as, a, as opposed to, you know, 10-4, right? Um, so uh, be advised. That's another, you know, that's another way. You know, if somebody asks you a question and you're saying, you're, you know, uh, yes, you're going to say affirmative. Um, we use the word break. If I'm talking to someone and I, I'm going to move on and I've finished my conversation with them and I need to talk to someone else, I'm going to say break or break from you. Uh, and then call the next person I need to talk to. So again, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are. But they, but this is basically, as you can see, these are all fairly easy to remember uh, words that uh, that we can use. And by using these specific words, a lot of times it can uh, it can avoid confusion uh, because the words that they're replacing at times maybe uh, have a higher likelihood of being misunderstood or when coming over a radio. But by saying acknowledge as opposed to yes, which at times might sound like something else or be too too abrupt and too quick if, you know we we ensure that our message is getting through and understood uh, so under uh, one thing the, the big thing to, to to realize out of all of this is the radio systems including the use uh use and channel selections that's the responsibility of all of us of every member of the fire department right this is not just the incident commander's responsibility it's not just the safety officer or your training officer every member of the fire department need to understand the radio systems and how they work. Uh, and one last thing to talk about is when we communicate, we use a system called, hey, you, it's me. So I'm always, if I'm going to call somebody on the radio, I'll be calling, you know, tapping command from CSRD district chief. Hey, you, it's me. You're going to use your, you're going to call the call sign you're calling to, they, that you're trying to, to get in touch with, and you're going to finish by saying who you are. All right. I'm just going to shut this one down here. Here we go. Okay, so mobile radios. Mobile radios, like we like like mentioned before, mounted in a fire apparatus. Um, could be uh, and basically the receiver and the transmitter are usually located somewhere in the cab uh, within the reach of the officer and the driver operator. So both have to be able to reach, right? Um, uh, the radio. Uh, we don't want it to be all the way over on the driver's, you know, left-hand side where the officer would have to reach over their lap. Um, it's because at, at times it may be required for, for a driver to go by himself, but if there's an officer there, they're going to be the ones handling the radio communications. Um, a lot of times we'll have headset uh, connections available for mobile radios. Um, uh, sometimes pumping apparatus might have extra connectors at the pump panel, uh, depending. Uh, so again, that officer, they're responsible for all communications while that apparatus is in motion. That takes that responsibility out of the driver's hands, right? That includes en route to the scene, returning from the, returning to the hall. That's going to, all communications and that's a, while the apparatus is in motion should be handled by that officer. If there's no one in the officer's seat, then it's the driver operator going to be doing it. Now you heard me talk about a little bit about simplex channels, duplex channels. We'll get into a little bit about that right now and what the difference is between them. So a simplex radio channel is it's it's a channel that uses one frequency, like a single frequency, to transmit and receive all messages. Right? Uh, it's basically radio to radio. Right? Uh, so you'll see one frequency, one can talk at a time. Um, when the first speaker is finished, the second can now press the button uh, and respond. Right? We use tactical channels, our simplex channels. We have TAC2, TAC3, TAC4. Those are tactical channels. They can't be heard by dispatch. They can only be heard by those in, like, that are close by. Uh, and they're a radio to radio communication. Usually it's one radio to multiple radios, uh, but the one that matters is the one that you're trying to reach. Is that, you know, whether it's the incident commander or your team leader. Uh, so, and that picture on the right just shows one can, they both cannot talk at the same time. Just way you can only talk, only if one is talking, the other needs to listen, right? And a big problem is when people start stepping on each other, is what we call it, when multiple people are trying to talk at the same time, uh, that can cause a lot of confusion on a fire scene. So really try to try to 
uh, wait and listen and make sure that you've got the opportunity to uh, to speak before before using that. So the so the next channel, I guess you know we we need to talk about is duplex channels, right? So duplex uh, duplex system um, in that system, a signal is sent to a repeater first and then to another radio, right? Uh, so it'll go from you know dispatch uh, or a firefly. It'll go from uh, you know dispatch to uh, to another radio system, a repeater system, and then from there it will go to our radios and vice versa. Right. Some some of these types of duplex systems allow you to transmit and receive simultaneously um, on two different frequencies. Still not very helpful. I mean, two people talking on the radio uh, certainly would garble communications and make it incomprehensible. So we still want to look at having only one talking at the same time at a time. Right. Uh, when we're looking at repeaters, we're usually trying to find places that are going to be, you know, uh, like on high points, we want them to be up high. So they have a, a larger range by doing it that way. We have a lot of problems in our areas with mountains and things like that. We work very hard to try and, um, you know, fix these issues as they crop up. Um, but, you know, the natural landscape uh, can definitely interfere with radio communications. So the higher we put them, the better our communications are gonna be. Uh, the, the repeaters also can be used to increase the range of a radio system and send signals uh, like over tall barriers. So we can go a lot farther typically with a duplex channel. Um, uh, and uh, then, then we can with a, with a simplex channel. So it, uh, this is a system, a trunk system is something you might find in, in some larger uh, cities uh, and things like that where, you know, these are systems like, so conventionally, the, the, the difference between a, a trunk system, the, the, uh, the opposite of that would be a conventional system, right? So in a conventional system, the, that frequency is dedicated to a single function. So we have our own frequencies. We're a fairly conventional system um, that we've purchased and that we have the right to use. So they're for us and, and, and for nobody else. A trunk system uh, typically takes, you know, whatever frequencies they have available to them and then shares them, right? Uh, and the idea here is that they're going to make the most efficient use of the resources. Um, so that's what a trunk system do. It shares the bank of frequencies to make the most efficient use of them, right? It uses repeaters to actually assign the transmissions to available frequencies, right? So in a conventional system, let's say we're trying to notify a controller, right? Um, uh, the term talk group is what distinguishes among the, the physical frequencies or channels, right? So we're going to say, you know, uh, all attack team go to, you know, TAC2, everybody else go to this other one, right? In a trunk system, just by turning the radio on, it notifies the trunking system controller, which then will assign uh, a channel to that specific radio. It doesn't have a frequency assigned to it until uh, the, the radio is turned on. By activating the press to talk button, it then it sends a request to the controller, who, and then the controller sends a message uh, that emits a three beep tone sequence telling the firefighter to continue with the transmission. Uh, I'm kind of glad we don't use this system, to tell you the truth, because the conventional is much easier to get through. So one of the most important things that we have that could happen, you know, in, uh, with the use of our radios are uh, emergency traffic, emergency messages. And I've got a couple of situations, uh, you know, just the pictures on there. But emergency traffic using a portable radio, um, we all, it's the responsibility of all firefighters and fire officers on a fire ground, right? Um, understanding how it works because we any firefighter could find themselves in that situation and understanding the system and how it works is incredibly important. Um, a few different types of emergency messages that may happen uh, that, that you may encounter on, on fire scenes and hopefully we don't uh, but they could happen um, that would be like a building evacuation or a building abandon, uh, a mayday call or a firefighter down call. Uh, these are all uh, under that uh, category. So emergency messages always, you know, they're urgent messages. They're going to take priority. Everything else is going to become secondary, right? Command will tell if, if command's receiving an emergency message, whether it's about, a, you know, a, a mayday or a firefighter down, uh, typically they're the ones issuing the building evacuation or abandon unless it's a safety officer calling them. But the command will say emergency traffic to say, and, and what that does is it gets everybody on the fire scene to stand by and listen. So that way, if you hear emergency traffic come over the radio, basically that's the time to zip your lip, not talk on the radio and stand by because something important is about to be said, all right? The firefighter in distress uh, will, will, the way that we signify we're in distress is by calling mayday three times. Mayday, 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 right? Uh, and 
again, after an, any time that there's an evacuation, a uh, mayday call, something like that, uh, the airwaves uh, need, to be re need to remain clear because the incident commander now has to do a roll call to account for the other members that are on scene, make sure that we can make account for everybody and that we, that, that's, uh, that's present on that incident scene. Uh, but if you hear mayday, 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 it's time to zip your lip and let that, that transmission go. This is an important transmission. Um, and as a firefighter, you need to be able to call mayday as soon as you think you're in trouble. Not when you know you're in trouble. As soon as you think there might be a problem here. Once you know you're in trouble, it might be too late. All right. So, so don't be shy on using that if you think there might be a problem. Okay, I got a little turned around. I got low. I, I got lost. Even you know, if it, if you can get rid of it quickly, great. But the but the reality is, a lot of firefighters have perished thinking that they can get through it, and uh, and they just get themselves in more trouble, deplete more of their air, and get and find themselves in a more dire situation, uh, which makes it harder for a rescue to take place. Uh, the incident commander in a situation like a mayday is going to use, and when they need to do, uh, when they need to gather information about that, is going to use uh, an acronym called LUNAR, L-U-N-A-R, and that stands for location, unit, so the location is what's the firefighter's location in the building, at the incident, are they on the fire scene? The, the unit, so who are they? And if for us, that would be like uh, attack one on primary search, right? Uh, the name, who is the firefighter specifically? Right, so you know this is you know, this is you know firefighter Kubra. Um, air is uh, is the A part, and that's about how much air do you have remaining, and resources. What are you go? What are what are they going to need to bring to be able to get you out of this mayday situation? Right. So location, unit, name, air, and resources. Uh, in the event of a, a mayday situation as well, all firefighters at the scene are gonna be directed to change to a different tactical channel, okay? The only people, the only person that's gonna be staying on the original tactical channel is the, is the Mayday firefighter and the rescue group. They're the only ones, uh, specifically the rescue group leader. And the incident safety officer is, is going to be made uh, the rescue group leader. Uh, if, if you have a safety officer available. If not, somebody else should be appointed. Um, the incident commander still has a fire to deal with. They still have other things and a whole other group of firefighters that they need to be aware of and, and take their safety into account. Uh, so by making the safety officer now the rescue group team lead, the, the rescue group leader, uh, basically it frees that, it, would, it puts one person thinking specifically about the mayday and coordinating that and the incident commander can keep their eyes on everything else, including me, right? So we'll talk a bit about dispatch as well. Dispatch, wonderful group. These people are our are, are lifeline when we're out on fire scenes, right? Um, so they, they have a hard job to do. And we need to know as well what, you know, what kind of steps that they go through. It helps us understand the job they do and the role they play for us. So the dispatcher receives a call for the fire from the fire, like for the fire department. They're going to follow five major steps, right? They receive the call. They verify the location of the incident. Um, what is the classification and priority of the incident? Structure fire much higher, wires down maybe a bit lower. Um, what fire hall do they need to go to? Uh, so again, Surrey Dispatch, they, they do all 13 of our fire departments and they do a lot of others, including Surrey. Um, so understanding where that goes and what, uh, and then they need, to, uh, they need to dispatch the resources that are required. So they'll, they'll drop the tones and, and, uh, and send the information to the fire department so that they can respond. So receive the call, verify the location, classify and prioritize it, figure out which fire hall, and then dispatch the resources. So when communicating with dispatch, uh, you need to make sure first off you're on the duplex repeater channel, right? Um, so basically when we use Surrey Dispatch, but we always call them your fire department dispatch. So if we're in Tappan Sunnybrae, Tappan Sunnybrae dispatch or Sunnybrae dispatch. Uh, if you're in Blind Bay, it's Shoe Swap dispatch. If you're in White Lake, it's White Lake dispatch. So it's name of the fire department dispatch. Uh, and what this does is it helps dis the, 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 the people at, at, at Surrey dispatch to know who's calling them exactly, right? Um, and it, because they have multiple radios operating at different times, they might have multiple fires in different locations or might have multiple emergency calls going on at, different, at, at the same time. Uh, and so by saying the name of your fire department and then dispatch, they know exactly which department is calling them. 
Again, dispatch, they're a lifeline to the outside world. They provide us with vital information from the reporting party. They can locate uh, pursue, like, and, and get us the resources we're gonna need out there. They provide uh, an estimated time of arrival on incoming resources. They can track our benchmarks. These are important and these are things that we, we need to be on top of as well. Benchmarks like you know units on scene, the fire struck, uh, writ is established. Those kind of things uh, become part of the dispatch log and are ways that we can now recreate and figure out what happened at these incidents uh, you know, and, and, and can be used in the future. So by, by marking these benchmarks, it's really doing us a favor to show that we're doing what we should have been doing and the time that it was taking us to do, right? Uh, other things dispatch does, they record our transmission and they compile uh, all the information call into, uh, from that one call into a dispatch log. And that dispatch log, like I said, they can be used in the event, you know, it can be used in legal proceedings, it can be used, uh, it can be used after the fact by, you know, insurance companies if they do freedom of information requests. There are people who can get their hands on this and, and again, we want, to, we want to make sure that uh, our communications are professional and, and courteous when we're talking. So that took us to the end of the safety and communications part. Now we're going to get into a little bit about firefighter rehabilitation. Um, so to rehabilitate, when we talk about rehabilitating, you know, we're not talking about taking somebody who's a criminal and making them better. We're talking about restoring someone or something um, to a condition of health or, uh, or a state of useful and constructive activity. Specifically, we're looking at making, you know, helping firefighters get their energy back. Um, as firefighters, we work hard in heavy, hot gear. Um, we need to be able to rest for our health, for our own health and safety, and to be a, to be to, to maintain a and be a productive member of the team. Uh, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind. You know, sudden cardiac deaths account for about forty to fifty percent of annual line of duty related fi uh, fatalities in the fire service. Um, it's cardiac arrests, right? And that comes from overexertion in a lot of cases, doing too much, pushing too hard, you know, that work ethic comes in. We are hard workers and we want to work hard, but we need to be able to rest and recuperate or we're not going to be a real productive member of that team. Uh, and, and rehab helps us ensure that the firefighters are getting that much needed rest to prevent major uh, health issues as a result of their strenuous work. So, a couple of things, you know, and, and there's some major components of firefighter rehabilitation that, you know, we should know about. First one is re rehydration, right? Rehydration, uh, you know, like when fluid uh, losses are greater than uh, fluid intake in the body, we're going to have dehydration. So we're losing more fluid than we take in. Eventually, we're going to dehydrate, right? We need to drink water. We need to take more in, right? So energy, uh, energy consumption, uh, calorie replacement, basically eating, right? Just like an engine runs on fuel, the human body runs on glucose, right? Uh, this, this, so when the body breaks down the carbohydrates in foods, that's the sugars and starches, and it makes glucose. And that's how the body runs, right? Um, strenuous activity like firefighting, that's going to cause the body to, to use up its glucose supplies much more rapidly. So we need, to, we need to replenish them. We need to eat. We need to, you know, have some granola bars on scene. On larger calls, we may end up having to get sandwiches and other things brought out. Um, you know, this isn't just about a, this is a completely a required and necessary thing for our health. We need to eat. Uh, and so the last thing we'll talk about uh, like uh, from uh, on this one is, you know, electrolytes and electrolytes are salts and other chemicals that are dissolved in bodily fluids, right? Um, electrolytes help us balance the amount of water that is in our body. Uh, they help us balance our pH level. Uh, we need to have electrolytes to function appropriately. We can start getting delirious when we get, the, you know, when we get dehydrated, when we lose these electrolytes. We need to replace them. Um, eat, drink things like, you know, um, sports drinks, Gatorade, Powerade, things like that. Uh, eat bananas, uh, watermelon, other things. So it, hopefully, you know, our departments, uh, as much as we can, we've got some kind of way of re replacing these electric electrolytes on fire scenes. So where are we going to need rehabilitation? Uh, could be any number of different kinds of calls, right? Uh, structure fires, pretty straightforward. Anyone uh, here who's been on structure fires has likely seen, you know, at least bigger ones that lasted, you know, uh, a few hours, uh, has probably seen rehab. And we often have, you know, BC Ambulance providing it for us, but many of our departments have, a, you know, all of our departments should be able to provide uh, a certain level of rehab. And some are, have some really bang up uh, programs out there, uh, Anglemont. Um, so, 
and, and they're not the only one. Um, but uh, some of the types of incidents we need to be aware of that we're going to need it structure fires, like I mentioned, wildland fires, um, special operations, and that's things like hazmat, swift water, which we don't typically uh, engage in, but you know, it, we may be called to, to assist others that are doing that, you know, and, and just kind of have some backup um, and rehab. Uh, and then uh, if we need it for, you know, other calls that we need it from re for relief from climatic conditions, right? Like uh, it's too cold, it's too hot. We need a way to, uh, you know, like if we have a long call and it's too cold or too hot, it's going to make it so that we need some kind of rehabilitation to, to, uh, to get out from those negative climatic conditions. Um, prevent the effects of things like hypothermia. Hypothermia is when uh, the internal body temperature falls below 35 degrees Celsius, 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you're in hypothermia, right? Uh, the uh, Hypothermia. Then there's hyperthermia. Uh, hyperthermia is a condition where the internal body temperature rises above 37 and a half, right, uh, degrees. That's over 99.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, hyperthermia can actually result in things like heat fatigue and cramps, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, um, so all very negative things. So overheating, it can be just as bad as, as, uh, as, uh, you know, freezing, if not worse in some cases. Uh, and another thing to be aware of, you know, goes along with hypothermia is frostbite. Uh, and frostbite is basically damage to tissues resulting from, uh, a, a long exposure to cold, uh, in some way, right? So understanding that, you know, frostbite is a possibility, we need to be aware of that. And then I guess the opposite of frostbite would be sunburn and getting burnt, you know, getting, uh, getting a sunburn, uh, you know, severe sunburns can be, it can have uh, negative health impacts certainly uh, and prolonged exposure and, and uh, over time can lead to some really nasty things like skin cancers. So one of the things that's also provided, we talked, you know, we talked about, you know, calorie replacement, you know, rehydrating electrolytes and that kind of thing. The, uh, another service provided during rehabilitation uh, is medical monitoring, right? Um, and we typically ask BC Ambulance to perform this function for us. Uh, although, our, like I mentioned, many of our fire departments are very, are very good at providing this type of monitoring as well. Uh, and we need to be able to do it because it's our responsibility to do it, not BC ambulances, but they are doing it for us and, and we thank them for it. They're doing a great job. Um, so again, it's, it's a requirement that uh, fire departments are, are, providing some, are providing that medical monitoring. So we have here in the CSRD a, a little uh, well, a flow chart that actually shows us how uh, it gives our rehab teams a bit of a guideline on how on how to operate. Again, this is a handout that I, I passed along, um, but this flowchart is is a guide to their behavior. It allows them to know when somebody is good to be released from scene, right? Uh, or released, sorry, from rehab. Um, and if you see the greens up here, this is where things are good, right? So you have your, your systolic between 100 and 160 and your diastolic between is less than 90. Uh, you have a pulse that's less than 110 beats per minute. Your oxygen is, uh, great, sorry, is greater than, is less than, uh, than 110. Your oxygen is greater than 95% and your temperature is, uh, is below 37.5. Now I didn't put in for hype, hype uh, hypothermia there because again that's not something we typically come into contact with you're working your butts off you're providing you're kind of creating your own heat uh, and then we have through the flow chart what to do if uh, you know whether it's a yes 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 you're back to work if there's any no's what do we do and it's all in here so I encourage you to look at it understand it uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and know what are what we're looking at when we do this uh, these were all you know this one yes Who's doing this for us? BC Ambulance. Uh, the flow chart you're showing us, is that BC Ambulance? BC Ambulance primarily, but it's our responsibility and our departments all have, uh, should have the ability to do rehab in the event BC Ambulance isn't available or able to make it to the scene. I thought we had a rehab truck at one time. What happened to that? Yeah, let's not talk about that right now. We'll, uh, we'll get into that. <laughs> if you want to talk about that, we can talk about it at another time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so again, I encourage you guys to look at that uh, CSRD rehab flowchart. Um, so some of the equipment that's gonna be needed to, to provide rehab are things like uh, a fingertip monitor that, uh, that does uh, you know, uh, pulse ox, uh, so your pulse and your oxygen levels. Um, an automatic BP cuff is, is uh, something that all, all fire departments should have, a thermometer with uh, the sheaths to go over top of it, the plastic sheaths, uh, so they don't have to disinfect it each time. 
Um, we have rehab paperwork that, uh, that we have as well that uh, each department should be using to track their members and uh, monitor over time how they're doing, uh, how, they're how their uh, vitals are doing. Um, other things for the rehab team, things like the water and electrolyte drinks, snacks, granola bars. Um, and for prolonged scenes, the incident commander should really consider looking at bringing something like a restroom to the scene or finding a facility that can be used for this purpose. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not acceptable necessarily on these longer scenes to expect that, that, that our firefighters are going to be outside, right, and, and doing their business outside. Um, and in some cases, it's just not a possibility. So other equipment, you know, depending on how, how as necessary, and uh, some departments have this, some don't. Um, but you know, some things you could have things like chairs to sit down on, pop up awnings to you know to keep you out of the sun, uh, blankets, and the list can keep going on and on and on. There's specially there's specially designed chairs that actually cool your your forearms to make sure you don't overheat. Um, so. Basically, you know, the incident commander, uh, one thing they, the, with the rehab, we want to maintain true integrity when we can. So if we, we send an attack team out and, um, and they come back and it's time for rehab, we want to keep that team together. We're not going to just say, okay, Bob, you're going to rehab right now. The rest of you guys, uh, I need you to do so-and-so. No, no. Like, we keep the crew integrity. Let's get them all there. Uh, and hopefully they can all be released at the same time. And if they can't, maybe the, other, the rest of the team could take a bit of a longer break until they can, right? Um, so when we yeah, again when we talk about crew integrity we're talking about the team attack one search one we're not talking about the entire department we do need to we need a constant rotation in firefighters to be working and we can't be taking breaks where everyone's sitting down in rehab right so when we're looking at our, our release from rehab um firefighters can be released from rehab once they've been rested rehydrated refueled and rechecked so we've checked once where they were at usually that first check they're going to be above our our, ba our our bare minimums and that's okay that's expected our how we we're going to have higher heart rates we're going to have higher blood pressure we've been working we've been working hard so one, so that rechecking happens at the end right we want to but then, again they want to be rested you've got you, i got my energy back got some fluids in me got some food in me They've checked my, my vitals again, I'm good to go, all right? That, and again, that, there's a picture of that flow chart on there again. That flow chart is gonna help, uh, it is basically the policy that's followed by the rehab teams to, to or guide anyways, to figure out when it is safe for firefighters to return to work. If you have issues with, you know, uh, you know, you have a higher than normal blood, blood pressure, heart rate, things like that. Again, this is, this is at this point, you know, kind of a one size fits all, but in some cases it doesn't fit. Um, and all we'd ask in those situations is that you have that discussion with your own doctor, uh, have them write something, you know, have them write out a medical note that you can give to your department and, and keep it on file uh, that would come out to, to fire scenes with you or even in a breast pocket that you know what is acceptable for you right? Uh, at one point, would your doctor be comfortable with you going out to work? And if they give you something like that to say, we're co he, there should be no problem with them being sent back to work with, you know, a, a higher blood pressure at this level or a higher heart rate or whatever it is. I mean, we're not, I'm not a doctor. Uh, and if a doctor is going to sign off on you for that, then, then, then more power to them. All right. Well, we made it through folks. So safety, again, it's, it's essential. It's essential in our mission to, to protect the public. We always want to protect ourselves with our wearing our PPE, following orders, following departmental safety procedures. Um, and we need to take responsibility for our own safety. Uh, you can't protect the community unless you can protect yourself, right? If we go down, we can't help. Um, fire department communications are essential uh, and they're a critical factor in the successful outcome of a fire scene. There's a direct connection between fire, uh, fire ground communications and safety, which is why they've combined these two into one, right? The better the communications, the safer the incident's gonna be. Firefighter rehabilitation is also, and, and firefighter rehabilitation is a vitally important function that protects the health and safety of our firefighters by detecting health concerns early and providing much needed rest and recovery for firefighters at the scene, and if required, uh, referring them on for medical intervention. And there have been times when firefighters have been sent uh, to the hospital we checked out. Each time it's come back okay, but that's a sign of our, our systems working and we'd rather do that out of an abundance of caution than find out uh, that somebody had an issue after the fact. So thank you all again. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll start taking them. I'm just gonna stop the recording at this point.